So obviously we've had a bit of a discussion earlier about kind of what LaTeX is, um, how you might use it, um, and a very brief kind of introduction. It's it's a very complex area, really, really powerful. And once you start to get to grips with some of the, like what you can do with it, then suddenly you'll be opening the door to loads more formatting things that you can do. I mean, personally, I didn't really get into it until I think probably the end of my undergraduate. I think I did possibly my final dissertation, but then my thesis, I found it so, so useful um, to produce it in LaTeX rather than trying to grapple with a let's like 240 long page long word document um which obviously is like four years worth of your life's work um but i'm going to go through overleaf um so what exactly is overleaf um so latex is obviously a typesetting program um overleaf is an online editing platform for that typesetting um so language, so Overleaf themselves, they're a social enterprise and they develop collaborative authoring tools. Uh, I think possibly their only offering, definitely their primary offering is uh, this online collaborative document editing platform. It's overleaf.com um, that allows you to do real time uh, editing of and the production of LaTeX documents, allowing you to collaborate quite easily. Cause as we've seen, potentially it's not that easy to necessarily uh, edit simultaneously a LaTeX document because obviously you've got all the additional auxiliary files and you've got the sort of compilation that you need to do in order to produce the output. But this platform can potentially help you to do that, especially if you want to do it as sim like at the same time. Um, you don't need obviously to download or install anything to use it. And it just sort of simplifies some of the aspects that maybe some of those barriers that would stop you from collaborating on um, a LaTeX a project. It's also really good if you're working on a machine that has restricted permissions um, because potentially you can't install tech or LaTeX on your system. Uh, so maybe Overleaf is an option that you could possibly use. So I'm just going to run through a couple of features. Obviously, clearly my systems are not quite working, so I'll try my best to keep everything um, running. Um, so this is some, but not all of the features that are available in LaTeX. Uh, this is in addition to kind of the features that have been demonstrated by Sammy. So all of those commands and sort of how you do the document structure, figures, um, references, all of that, that is all in Overleaf. Um, these are kind of extra wrappers around that. Um, you can have kind of lots of projects and do collaboration. I'll run through examples of some of these uh, in my live demo later. Um, as we've had a lot of, we've had a bit of discussion about kind of WYSIWYG and kind of a bit more graphical interfaces. They do also offer a rich text mode in addition to editing the source code. Uh, personally, I've not used it really because I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of scope for things kind of going a bit wrong and getting a bit confusing. Um, so once you're kind of familiarized with how the LaTeX code works, it's a lot easier to do it in that. Um, but I will show that um, in there. Um, so some of the things we've touched on in previous workshops about collaboration, so things about like version history um, and doing chat and reviewing changes, uh, those features are available in Overleaf um, in potentially in a way that you wouldn't get by default in a local installation. Although obviously you can integrate um, your LaTeX files with a document system uh, like Git. Um, to allow you to keep your own versions, which is so useful when you have a very important project where clearly you don't want to lose any changes um, that might have broken something or accidentally delete a file and it's your only copy of it, which would be possibly the worst thing that could happen. Um, so I've just got a screenshot here. I will be doing the live demo, but um, this shows the Overleaf interface actually in its rich text format. Uh, so here in the middle left, you have the pane for your editing of the document. Um, on the right hand side, you have the output. Um, once it's done its templating and it's actually compiled the document, this is what you would get out. Um, on the left hand side, you have your kind of files associated with your project. And then across the top here, you have some of the additional functionalities. So here you can sort of review um, and share and kind of do the functions around it. There's also a few other menus that are kind of available when you click on different things. 
Um, I'm just gonna quickly go through um, sort of the number, there's a different plans available in Overleaf. So it does have free versions, uh, but it also has a number of different paid plans. Uh, so in the basic plan, you get access to Overleaf and you can use it pretty much kind of to do simple collaboration. Um, it will allow you to have one named collaborator, um, but you can do uh, link sharing, which will allow you to kind of share with other people, but they aren't, um, I don't think they're given full access to the project in a way a named collaborator is. Um, and it doesn't have the advanced features, um, but it can still be useful if you're doing a small project or possibly if you're doing your, if you wanna do your own private uh, projects, but you can't install the local version of tech. Um, if you wanna collaborate in a larger group, they offer sort of a personal plan. Uh, most of you will probably be eligible for a student plan, or you might have access to uh, the professional plan through your institution. And these give you like higher tiers. Once you get above personal, it's basically how many collaborators you can have on a single project. As you can see, it goes up from six to 10 to unlimited. Um, they all mainly have the integrations with the reference managers and sort of file storage, um, in addition to like tracking changes. Um, on the personal version, you don't get all of the features, um, but you still get the version history. Um, through your institution, you might get access to something called Overleaf Commons, which will provide you with an Overleaf professional account to any person who I think is a staff or a student at that institution. Uh, if you do have access to that, uh, probably best place to check is your library. And then you can either convert an existing Overleaf account over to that professional account, or you can directly sign up and then get those features. Uh, we do have Overleaf Commons. So what I show you on my account, it has an, over, uh, it's an Overleaf professional account. Um, so before I go and do the live demo, um, I wanna talk, oh, I've just seen Dave's question. So it says, would you say Overleaf is like Google Doc for LaTeX? It definitely has some of the similar features. So it's a lot more like in terms of real time, you can see different people doing, I think you can see cursor locations uh, where people are working in the document. Um, it does have a lot more of those features around it. Um, obviously it's still not completely WYSIWYG, um, but it, yes, I guess a consideration you could say is it's sort of like a Google Doc for LaTeX. Um, so a couple of considerations. Um, Overleaf is online um, and it does use cloud storage. Um, so because of this, um, what we've said in previously is obviously you have to be mindful of what you're putting up there. Um, if the storage is outside of your institution, which I'm pretty sure it is for all Overleaf um, things, it's not like necessarily like the um, OneDrive where you can bring it inside your institution you should not be putting any sensitive data or anything up there. Um, only things that would be able to be published. Um, another consideration is that it will require internet access um, if you're actually using it on their server because the comp like when you compile it, it uses an engine that's hosted. Um, so if you aren't connected to the internet, you won't be able to use it through the web browser. You can link it up to sort of your Dropbox, but if you do that, you will require a local tech installation um, to actually run it through, run the compilation and produce the output. Um, and the final thing I wanna to touch on is just because you can do something in LaTeX doesn't necessarily mean that you should be doing it in LaTeX. Um, it's primarily used for the production of documents, sort of reports, papers, dissertations. Um, for example, as illustrated by this lovely comic by Errant Science, it is possible to use LaTeX to create images, anything that's sort of like a vector-based graphic you can create in LaTeX, but by and large, you're probably better off using imaging software unless that image is part of your report and it utilizes some formatting that's specifically available in LaTeX. So yeah, be, care like, be mindful of what you use it for. It's really, really powerful but you shouldn't necessarily try to do everything in it. Okay, so I'm gonna make a prayer to the um, computing gods and um, just bring up uh, my next 
section and just hopefully this will work. I am going to switch over through all of my tabs to Overleaf. Uh, so I'm going to give you a quick live demo of this. Fingers crossed, nothing breaks. Hopefully not. Um, so if this is Overleaf. This is my um, sort of home screen. It shows the projects that belong to me. Um, you can see here it shows some sort of information about the um, document. It also allows you to sort of tag or organize your documents. When you don't have very many documents, that might not be so useful. But once if you start working on a lot of documents, you might want to categorize them into different um, folders. Um, so uh, each of these projects is going to produce a single kind of output document. Um, and I'm going to open up one of these projects. So I'm going to open up uh, the S4S Overleaf. I already have it open in this tab. So hopefully it won't go anywhere. Um, at the moment, I'm in the rich text tab. So I'm just going to quickly click here and change it over to the source. Um, so now you'll see this is the pure LaTeX code, uh, which you will have seen snippets of this in Sammy's slides earlier. Um, this is a pretty standard, simple example of a document. Um, you can see I have the editing area, the PDF output. On the side up here, I have some files. So I have my tech file. I have some bibliography files that contain references. Um, but I don't have all of these auxiliary files uh, that they've see, you've seen in the demo. Um, but you can download those files if you need to over here. Um, you can also see it's got a couple of, it's got a bit of the sections of the document. You can see here, I've got sort of the sections of an intro, analysis, conclusion, an image in, but I've also got potentially some other features that are new that I've implemented into the LaTeX um, code. Uh, you'll also, yeah, so these are commands. Uh, you can begin the figure, um, sort of do things like that, stick in a bibliography. Um, those are the commands that Sammy outlined in her talk earlier. Um, but if I start here, I'm just going to go here and I'm going to make an edit to this text here. And then you should see up here, it says compiling. It automatically compiles the document. And now you can see it says introduction instead of intro here. Um, it will by default do automatic compila uh, compilation. Uh, if you don't want that to happen, you can just click here and turn it off. In that case, it will then require you to manually click it like you would have done a compile command um, if you're using an IDE. Um, you can also see that I have a warning up here. Uh, this warning is actually because I am calling a bibliography, but I don't actually have any citations yet. Uh, but I will go through um, sort of an actual error. Um, so if I make it give me an error. <laughs> so if I were to bring do something like call the command backslash hello. That's a command that doesn't actually exist in LaTeX. And so you'll see here that it doesn't actually compile it because it fails. And it tells me I have an error. The previous one was just a warning, so it will compile, but an error might stop it from actually compiling at all. Um, in fact, I think it possibly didn't compile the last time because it says hell instead of hello. Um, but it will show me where it's doing it and it will give me kind of an information about what, what it is. And you can click to get more information about it. Uh, so it says it's most likely a command that's spelled incorrectly. In this case, it doesn't exist. But maybe if you mistyped um, section um, and made a spelling mistake, it might also come up as an error here. And you can sometimes click on the uh, link here and it will take you to the line that has the error. And here you can see a box saying it's got an error. So it's usually, it's a little bit more helpful sometimes than the IDE's error messages. Um, so yeah, sometimes they can be a little bit hard. It's um, always fun trying to hunt down a missing bracket um, from your code um, that yes, is, is sometimes fun. You might spend a little while doing that. It's always satisfying when you do fix it. Um, but you can also see that I've got a little some highlighted text here. This is because I've used track changes in the document previously. So if I click here to review the document, I can see here currently track changes is off, 
but I can set this on either for everyone or for specific people. If I was sharing this document, you'd get a little bit more um, sort of flexibility in how you do that. Now, if I make a change and I get rid of that, you can see that it gives me uh, sort of a deleted section here. Previously, I added this bit into the, this top section and I added a note here. Um, and then you can either reject and then it will revert the change or accept a change and then it will remove the tag. Um, so this is pretty useful if you're editing a document that's maybe closer to the finishing point. If you're starting out at the very beginning, it might not be quite so useful because otherwise every line in your document is going to have a track change in it and you'll have to go through and process them all. Um, but it will allow you to see who has written which bits, which might potentially be useful depending on um, your specific use um, for it. I'm just going to turn that off again now because otherwise it's going to annoy me um, and I can close the pane again there. Um, so we've covered a little bit before in our talks about how it's useful to have kind of structure and sort of things that help you to work out who maybe who's doing what or things that need to be done in your projects. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how you can do comments um, in the document and possibly to other people who might be reading the document, uh, maybe either saying why something was done or what needs to be modified. So. There's no real right or wrong way to do this. Personally, I have developed a system that uses three different methods. Um, so the first one I do is I use the comment flag. So in LaTeX, so a lot of do, uh, languages have a way to add a comment into the code. In LaTeX, we use the percent symbol. So this is a special character. And it means everything on that line after the percent symbol will be commented out. This is important because if you try to put a comment in the middle of the line, you might miss off extra bit at the end, which so you need to then put that on the following line. Um, these comments aren't visible in the output. So these maybe are used to um, explain why you've put something in, uh, mark sections of your document, or possibly to put a note to a collaborator, like a, quite a long note, um, or put in a section of text uh, that's maybe you don't want it in the output, but it's useful to have in the code. Um, so you can use those percent symbols. The other way uh, to do that is um, to use a package to produce something that is visible in the output. Uh, so we've mentioned packages a couple of times. So obviously a package in LaTeX is similar in concept to uh, like a module, potentially a library in Python. So it's a collection of kind of code and formatting that's been written by somebody else that you can quite simply include into your document and it allows you to access new features by calling specific commands. Uh, so I will finish off by talking about some useful packages. Uh, so in this um, package, so all packages are, call, are called in what's called the preamble. So before you actually begin your document, it's where you put all your kind of sections about how the document should be done, um, specifics on how it's formatted um, and things like that. I call something which is called the X color package. This allows you to basically use color in your document. Here, I've also got a couple of parameters that I pass to the package. So I call it using use package, pass it some sort of options and parameters, and then this is the package name. Here, I've got a comment saying, this is the package that allows use of color. Um, it's really simple to use. Then what I can do is set um, a section of text to a different color, but it doesn't change how the text is um, sort of displayed. It still takes up the same amount of space in your document. It will just be called a different color. So here in the output, you can see that this section is in orange. Um, and actually, I should be able to, this didn't work the other day, you should be able to use these arrows to either go to the location in the code or from a location in the code, find it in the PDF, which can be very helpful in long um, documents. It didn't quite work. Um, it usually works on my local one, um, but in a longer document, it's usually quite accurate in how it goes to the nearest maybe paragraph. Um, but here, 
you use the braces to kind of wrap around to say this section of text and then slash color. And then I tell it I want it to be orange. Um, and then this section, oh, let's not move that bit of text. This section of text, which is included in these braces is orange. The rest of the text that's outside of it has not been affected at all. Um, this is good, um, but what's important to do is to make sure that you um, have a system. What colors mean what? Um, so like, for instance, I you have put a thing here that says use colored text for placeholders or text that needs rewording. And then red for missing or incorrect, blue for what rewording, orange placeholder text. So that's the system that I use. Obviously, feel free to develop a system for your project um, and have some sort of documentation of what it is. I also use the to do notes package. This produces these notes in the side margins of the text, which is really useful when you don't want to put something in that doesn't actually increase the amount of text that's in the main body. Uh, this is similar to putting um, sort of note comments and notes in like a PDF or in a Word document. Um, so I call it in a similar way um, using this one. It's got a few more parameters because I um, personalized the color and how it's the, like displayed. Um, and this adds the notes. Um, here, I'm also going to quickly show you, I've made a custom command because basically a lot of the time I want to add a reference. So I'll add a note that says add reference. Instead of always writing out this long command here, I want to have something shorter to do it. So in fact, I've created a command that just says slash add ref. And then whenever I do that, it will instead act like it's putting in this long section of code and output me a note which says add reference. Uh, so here you can see that I've actually um, called that simply just by going slash add ref. And you can see here, um, I want to do something in there. Um, okay, so Aspen has a comment about rich text. Um, so basically the rich text option, it sort of provides that graphical interface to allow you to do it. Uh, so if I switch over to the rich text version here, you can see it handles some of it well, it doesn't handle some of it at all. Um, it will factor in like the header and sort of things like that. It will give me like a title and sort of my sub like header. That's, but obviously the top section, it doesn't handle the preamble uh, very well. Um, some of the things um, it won't, if you have custom commands, it doesn't know how to handle all of those, um, but it can be quite useful because you can add in like a section header. Um, um, and then it will automatically show you how it's formatted. So it can sometimes be useful if people like struggle to get to grips with the source code or prefer something a bit more graphical. Personally, I've never used it because I find it so much um, easier to just use the code once you get to grips with the kind of base structure of how it works. Um, so, so I've gone through a little bit. This is how to do a very simple command. These form the backbone of most of the customizations in uh, LaTeX. A lot of the um, different classes and the different style files that you get will use those. Um, I see since we ran over a little bit on the other one, we are running a little bit uh, tight on time. Uh, so I'm going to skip a little bit of some of the stuff. Um, I will include some slides uh, alongside this. So there are maybe a few extra bits in there that won't necessarily be in here. Um, you can see that I can call a citation uh, using my um, using a bibliography that I have installed up here. Um, and this will automatically pull in a citation and add it to like a bibliography list. This is really powerful. One of the like a really good feature of LaTeX is when you're producing a really long bibliography, um, hundreds of references. It's very, very good at handling those. Um, 
and you can change kind of how it's formatted. If anybody has any questions on that, do get in contact with us um, and we can go through that a little bit more. Um, you can also link it up with sort of Zotero. So here you'll see this was imported from Zotero, which is a reference manager um, that I covered in a previous talk. Or you can manually kind of upload um, files from your um, other reference managers. You can manually do them. And also Sammy suggests if you do that to uh, alphabetically order them. And then you can use comments to um, switch. So sort of say A, B, C, and then you can easily find which author you're looking for um, when you do that. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over a couple of templates. So what's quite powerful in LaTeX is you can use templates. Um, so if I were to create a new project, you can see here, you can get a lot of different types of templates. Um, I'm just really quickly going to go to the gallery. So this would show templates for, say, CVs. And then if the screen share would move out of the way, I'm going to just quickly show, like, this is, say, an example of the code and then the output uh, from an example CV. You could also do it for a journal paper. There's a lot of different journal papers available, all formatted for different styles of journals. And here you see the code and the output for a Royal Society of Chemistry example journal. Um, and then you can also use it for something like a thesis, which is a lot, a lot bigger. This one here is an institutional template that we have available to us at the University of Southampton. Um, so that is a much bigger document. Um, you can see here, if I go to the main thesis, um, so Sammy mentioned earlier about how you can split up a large document. Um, this has a lot more preamble and a lot more styles around it. You can see here it's a different document class. So instead of being uh, like an article or something, it's using ECS thesis. Uh, so actually this is calling this class file which has already got a lot of um, custom commands, styling, how it's shown, how different things are called, how the, depending on how your institution requires it to be done. I would advise where possible not touching these class files. If you need to customize things yourself, you can do an additional style file. So for example, this file here is the file, the style file I used in addition to the ECS thesis one when I wrote my um, thesis. And this calls some additional packages, changes a few kind of things here. For example, you can see that command about uh, calling the to do notes package with the specific um, colorations that I used and the commands for adding a reference. Um, it's really helpful to stick this outside of your main document so that it doesn't clutter up your main document. And you can simply call this in the same way that you would call a package. So you just say use package and then reference to where your style file uh, sort of is located if it's not in the same uh, document. Uh, so that's really useful when structuring a big document. The other thing you can also do is split it into separate files. You can either use this include command, which then calls sort of to the introduction.tech file, which would obviously be a separate chapter. Um, or you can use something called subfiles, which is another package. Uh, personally, I find that as a lot more useful because you can compile that subfile by itself. Um, so instead of having to compile the whole document, you can just compile one chapter. Um, another way to speed up the uh, compilation is to use something called the draft flag. So if I go to my uh, the document I was doing earlier that has an image in, when I um, have it right at the top here, where I have the document class, if I just give it the option draft, oh, if I spell it correctly, that is, draft, and then hopefully compiles it the second time. This is sometimes why auto compilation is not so useful if you make uh, mistakes. Now you can see it's exactly the same spacing and layout, but this image is no longer displaying the actual image. Um, when you have 30, 40 images in your document, this can significantly speed up how fast your code compiles. So if you're not actually needing to see the images, you can use draft and get the proper layout and it's all much faster. 
Um, so I'd advise using that. Um, so this is a bit of a whistle stop tour. Uh, the other thing it's very important to do if you're doing large projects is think about how it's structured. So obviously we talked about splitting it up into files, but think about doing the same for when you're doing your graphics. If you've got lots of images for your different chapters, maybe split them up into subfolders. You can also reference towards those. Just basically think about the sensible structure rather than just having hundreds of things all in the same area because future you will not be quite so happy. Um, you can also submit directly from Overleaf to certain journals. Um, so there's a wide variety of different places that it will allow you to submit to. You can like publish it to be in a sort of an example gallery or to certain journals or online repositories. And it will kind of guide you through how to do that if you're submitting a journal paper. Um, and I've not personally done that. Um, not to a journal that supports it, but there is a lot of guidance on the Overleaf pages. Um, and also you can do presentations. So I'll show you a quick example of a presentation that is complete done in LaTeX. Again, this is a case of where you might not want to do it in LaTeX if it's not the best tool for you. Um, something like PowerPoint or Google Slides might be better, but you can use something called PowerDot or Beamer, uh, which are two classes um, that will produce presentations, similar structure. You have sort of different areas that define what's a slide and what's the content. And then it will do different styles. You can show different things coming up at different times or different formatting. Um, cool, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna quickly jump to, I mean, I think I covered most of the stuff in my demo. Um, hopefully this, is going to come up. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, so these are a couple of the packages that we referenced in our talks. So we have to do note and X color. Are those, are those ones I went through. If you're using figures, you really need to be using graphic X. Um, all the links in these will be available on the slides. Um, URL and hyperref are really useful for doing URLs and cross-linking to make sure they get formatted correctly. And as I mentioned, subfiles uh, for doing large um, projects. Um, if you're doing large tables that go over one page, um, you can use the package long table. I think possibly one of my most proud LaTeX moments has been sort of a multi-page horizontal table, um, which just looked beautiful. Um, if you're looking for more specific examples, so you're wanting to produce something that's domain specific. Um, so the CTAN is the repository for where a lot of the packages are. You can search by topic. So there's like a chemistry um, section on there. So they have things, um, so for the molecular orbital diagrams, um, and they also have some sections uh, for basically displaying chemical um, drawings rather than just inserting it as an image. You can actually get it to you can kind of define where the um, atoms are and sort of the bonds, and then it generates an image for you. Um, so there's a couple of packages there. Um, and just finally, a couple of top tips. So I've already covered some of these. Don't clutter up your main tech file. Move it out of it where you can. Compile it in draft mode. Write commands for things that you repeat a lot. It will save you a lot of time. As Sammy mentioned earlier, when copying things in, check it as you copy it in, particularly for quote marks. That definitely happens a lot of the time. Um, and one thing that I think is quite important is, it's really useful to use LaTeX, but sometimes it might, it might not allow you to write as freely as you would if you were writing in Microsoft Word or in just a plain text editor. So do sometimes feel free to just write it in chunks in plain text, just the actual content of what you want to write, and then copy it across into LaTeX and add the formatting commands. Because obviously you want to be able to write creatively when you're actually wanting to form the content. Don't necessarily be like, oh, I can't use LaTeX because it stops me from being able to write. Do the writing in whatever you're comfortable in. And then if you want to put it into LaTeX, you can always do that kind of after you've got the content, if you like the way that LaTeX 
actually typesets it. Um, and there's just a couple of links there for further reading. I think some of these were covered in Sammy's talk. There's a lot of information out there um, about LaTeX and how you can do it. Um, so many different options. But yeah, you can find a lot of information on sort of Stack Exchange, Overleaf, um, and the kind of wiki books 